Today you can be free. You can have your sins forgiven. Hello and welcome to the program To The Point. And you know what? With me in the studio today is a man of God by the name Dr. Richard Kent. He's a man that's loaded. Loaded with the Word of God and loaded. He has a lot of info about things that would encourage you, that would build up your faith and transform your Christian life. And get ready with your pen and paper because you're going to have to take down some information. Because guess what? He's about the only person I know in town that gives away free DVDs, free books, free everything for you to send around the whole world to friends, be they Muslims, Hindus, or Buddhists, whoever they are. But you know what? Sit back because today we're going to be talking about the Shroud of Turin. I've heard about it before, but the thing is, you have conflicting arguments from both sides, and at the end of the day, I don't seem, you know, you don't seem to know exactly what's going on. So we've got a doctor here today to make sense of everything. So you know what? Whatever you do, don't touch that dial. God bless you as you continue to watch. Welcome to the program, sir. Hi, Yemi. How are you? Good <laughs> to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. Yes. And I know we're going to enjoy the program this afternoon because yeah. I've been out with you a few times yeah. and you shared some things with me that's mind-boggling. Oh, and I know the next few weeks you're going to be sharing things that will really, really bless so many people. And I thank God for your life, for your research, and for your dedication to the things of the kingdom. Now, the, sh the Shroud of Turin. Yes, Yemi. <laughs> you know, how long have you been interested in this? I've heard about this thing for so many years. And still, it, some guys will say it's fake, some will say it's real. So, and so you don't know exactly what's going on. But how long have you been researching into oh, this Shroud? I'll tell you, since I first became a Christian, 1974, so 36 years. Wow. 36 years I've been looking at the Shroud of Turin. Just look at that picture now. They're looking at Jesus there. Just look at the picture, of, if you can get that picture up on the PowerPoint. Is that the real picture that's, of Jesus? That's, a, that's, a, that's what Jesus, is, Jesus looked like, yeah. And we're going to be talking about that. And by the way, on the right is a three-dimensional image of Jesus on the Shroud. We're going to talk about that as well. You know, the Shroud of Turin is the real deal. It's the real thing. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about the Shroud, and then you can ask me right. some more questions. It's, it's actually on display right now. That's why we've chosen this, um, this particular subject today, because uh, the Shroud of Turin is on display in Turin, in Italy, that's Turin Cathedral. And that's what it looks like in a great big glass screen. And uh, that's what it looks like. Um, it looks like a photo negative image. You know, when in the old days, when you had a Kodak camera, you took your, your film along to the uh, cinema, uh, along to the boots or wherever it was. And uh, you can't, when you got your prints back, you got your negatives. Now look at that picture again. What you're looking at that is, is, is negatives. That's what they are. It's a negative at the front and back of a huge piece of cloth called the shrouded Turin. Uh, it's in the Bible. Now look, when you take a photograph, you see that's Jesus' face. That's what you can see on the left-hand side. But you take a photograph of it, uh, your negative is actually a positive. But can you see some white streaks coming down from the top? That's blood. So that is a mixture of photo-negative and photo-positive. So Yemi, I know everyone says it's a fraud. Of course it's not a fraud. Now why would Leonardo da Vinci create something in photo-negative and photo-positive? Um, he lived in 1450. He didn't have a camera. He might have had a very simple camera. They called it a, a camera or obscura or a camera occulta. But he couldn't, uh, he couldn't do sophisticated st stuff like this. Taking, we don't know how to do it now to take images in photo positive and photo negative at the same time. But it's in three dimensions as well. It's unique on the planet. This thing is the real deal. And I'm really excited about it. <laughs> it's, right. it's exciting, but then on the, you, but you, you talk with so much authority that that is the face of Jesus. Of course. Some people will be asking, how do you know it is the face of Jesus? But before we get to that point, yes. <laughs> you know, this shroud was displayed uh, a few weeks ago it is. in Italy. But then it seems that the shroud comes out occasionally. How, why is it that it's brought out occasionally, not there constant for us to well, see? Well, I'll tell you what. The thing is that the shroud, I believe, has been around there since the first century of the time of Christ. Um, they've dated it around 1325. But whatever way, it's, it's quite old. So they want to preserve it. They preserve it actually in argon, which is an inert gas. But the truth is the actual shroud is, is actually the color. It's a sort of yellow color. It's slightly um, decaying, if you like. So they want to preserve it. And the other fact thing is that they're talking about doing a DNA testing. They want to make sure too many people don't touch it. Because obviously if people touch it, they transfer DNA to it. So they want to preserve that thing. They bring it out roughly every 25 years. But it's been on display in Turin for the last six weeks. And that's why it's very topical right now. 
So what can you tell us about the recent display? Well, it's just been on display uh, um, for the last six weeks. I don't know why, because it, it isn't 25 years since the last time it has been, but they brought it out. Uh, it's very topical. Um, people are very divided. The, the atheists say <laughs> they did their carbon dating. Uh, let me just tell you straight away, the viewers, is uh, carbon dating, that machine, pretend that's a carbon dating machine. Let me tell you what the carbon dating machine does. It tells you how much radioactive carbon is in a piece of material. It doesn't tell you how old it is. That is man's interpretation. What you've got here, which I'll show to you today, is a first century piece of cloth, but it's very radioactive. Why? Because it's been radiated. It's been radiated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's, how, that's how it got radioactive. Okay. But then what is the historical evidence of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus himself? Let's, let's move on then. Let's, um, can, we just, can we just, before we go, let me just, I want to show the viewers a little okay. bit about this. Before, I'll answer that question in a second. But I just want them to understand about the photo negative and the photo positive first, and then I'll answer your question. Brilliant. Okay, let's just move to these pictures now. Uh, Secundo Pier was an amateur guy, a bit like me, really. <laughs> uh, he was actually a, a lawyer. But in 1898, he took this photograph, um, and he took uh, a photograph of the Shroud of Turin. Now, to try and explain, to, so you can understand, on the left there is Sir Robert Louis Stevenson, but the negative of him, and on the right is Sir Robert Louis Stevenson, as you would normally see him. What you're seeing on the Shroud is a negative. Do you see that? It's a negative. So on the left there, the Shroud is a negative, and on the right is a photo positive. But it's not a true photo positive because, it's, as I said to you before, it's got that blood tracking down. And that's real blood. And by the way, the blood got on there before the image was put on there. And let me tell you, that special blood is, uh, is type AB. Only 3% of the population have got that. And it's full, it's absolutely full of a special bile pigment which is released during torture. So whoever was that man on the shroud had been tortured. And that's why it's full of that, that bile pigment. Anyway, so there we have that the, on the left and on the right. That's what, the, the one on the left is what you see in Turin. The one on the right is, the, is the, the negative of the one on the left. But actually, it's a photo positive, and we'll be talking about what you can actually see. Um, and that, that, by the way, was the, the back image. It's a front image and a back image, but we'll be talking about that. But anyway, let's, uh, let's ask your, answer your question now. There's lots of evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. The um, main thing is the Bible says he did. <laughs> <laughs> and he was seen by 500 people, whatever it was. Um, of course, early on in his ministry, in Mark chapter 10, um, if you'd like just look at the pictures for a minute, it says in Mark 10, and says, Jesus said right early on in his ministry, it said they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. Well, I know you've heard of Josephus. He, he wrote a historical book, you know, um, the works of Josephus, and this is what he wrote. I had to put my glasses on to read it, actually. <laughs> He wrote in his, uh, in his book, he was born in 37 AD, and this is what he wrote. He said, now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. Pilate condemned him to the cross, and he, appear, and he appeared to them alive on the third day. So how about, Yemi, if you read in the, Sunday, in, the, in the Times or the Telegraph today that Jesus Christ rose on the third day, according to the secular news of the day. And Josephus was the secular news of the day. He said, Jesus rose on the third day. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. So that is pretty good evidence, isn't it? So, what, so now tell us, what happened after the crucifixion? Yeah. And how was he buried? Well, this is a very good question, because Jesus' burial was slightly different from uh, a normal Jewish uh, uh, burial. Let's just first concentrate on what happened after the crucifixion and just look at the pictures again. It's easier for people to understand you know, I'm a simple sort of person, and I, I understand pictures, <laughs> because I'm simple. So look, just look at the pictures for a minute. Um, there is actually Golgotha. Uh, that's the place of the skull. Um, and Jesus was actually crucified at the, uh, what's called the Calvary Escarpment, uh, which is at the base of Golgotha. It's near the garden tomb. Um, and he carried with him to the cross uh, the particular garden tomb. Um, and he carried with him to the cross uh, the patibulum, that's that cross beam going across his shoulders. And it, and, uh, but after he was dead, they took him down from the cross. It was a very nasty old business. Uh, they had to use a pair of pliers to take those nails out. Now, you imagine, Yemi, the first thing they have to do is put a piece of cloth over his face. If somebody had died in the, outside on the road, the first thing you do is cover the face. So that's what they did. So they, if you look at that picture there, they used that a little napkin or handkerchief called, in Greek, a sudarian, okay? Um, 
and then they covered his body with a long piece of cloth, 14 foot long and three, uh, three, three, foot, three and a half feet wide, called a sindon or a thonia in the scriptures. Um, and that's what they did. So there's that picture, that's what they did. They, they only had between three o'clock in the afternoon when Jesus died and six o'clock in the evening when Passover started uh, to cover him. And that, can you see that big piece of cloth on the right hand side? That's what it looks like. And they used that bit of cloth to wind Jesus, to cover Jesus' body and put him in the garden tomb. So they put him in the garden tomb, there he is going in the garden tomb. And uh, the tomb was owned by Jesus, uh, Joseph Arimathea. And by the way, Jesus only borrowed it for three days and three nights, didn't he? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then Joseph Arimathea can have it back again. Um, anyway, they rolled that big stone across there. And then uh, they, put, they put that uh, seal across there. And then they nailed that spike in. And by the way, Yemi, that spike is still there. You can go and touch it. Have you been to the garden tomb? I've been to the garden Okay, well, time. next time you go there, you go and touch that. That is a first century Roman spike. Wow. It's, it's covered in lead. Anyway, then Jesus, his, he died here, of course, he was dead, so his spirit was in paradise, and he was preaching to all those who were drowned in Nair's flood, but his body was still in the garden tomb in that little place there. But it says in Psalm 16 that he wouldn't, his body wouldn't decompose. So, after, I wasn't there, you weren't there, but sometime after three, three days and three nights, he was resurrected, and it was a tremendous burst. Now, I believe something happened that caused the image to come on the shroud because there's no paint on that shroud. So something dramatic happened to cause the paint come on the shroud. Um, the resurrection happened, which we're going to talk about later. And um, it's a bit like what happened um, at the Transfiguration. We'll talk about that later. And there's a release of nuclear energy. And that is how the photonegative image got on the shroud. So if you'd like to look at that, that's what the shroud looks like, that photonegative image. And we're going to be talking about how it got in there in three-dimensional, a three-dimensional image. So after three days, Jesus came back to life again. And let me tell you something really interesting. You know, Peter and uh, John, they went in there and he said they saw something and they believed. Now, what did they saw? They saw those two pieces of cloth, Sidarian, um, and, uh, or the Athonia, that's the large piece of cloth. And the, uh, sorry, the Sidarian is the little handkerchief on one side. And then the Sindon or the Athonia. But what they probably saw was a fresh scorch mark on the huge piece of cloth of the resurrection. I'm sure they saw, they saw an empty tomb. By the way, the, the, the great big stone only went back so that they could get in. Jesus can walk through stones. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't, do you know what I mean? They, they only rolled, the angel rolled the stone back so that Peter and Mary and the two, and J, Peter and James could get in there, not yeah. so that Jesus could get out. <laughs> That's an important point. But anyway, when they got in there, they saw and believed. Well, what did they see? Well, they saw, first of all, these two pieces of cloth, but more importantly, well, I think what they saw is these scorch marks, freshly made. You know, if you've got a, <clears throat> if you like, if, I'm terrible at ironing. When I iron my shirts or whatever, sometimes I talk to my wife and we get chatting and, I'm, oops, I've made a scorch mark on my white shirt. Well, that's what they saw on the Shroud of Turin, you see. That's what they wow. saw. And they saw an image of Jesus Christ. And they thought, wow, he's, he's, come, he's, gonna, he's done what he said he's going to do. He's risen from the dead. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You know what? If you want to join us in this discussion today, you have questions or you have comments, you know, you want to contribute to the discussion, you can send your emails through to live at revelationtv.com. Live at revelationtv.com. And if you want to send a text, the numbers are on the screen. So you can, we will read everything out. So God bless you, and I hope you enjoy what you're hearing. But you haven't heard anything yet. God bless you. Now, so what normally happened at a Jewish, a Jewish burial, like the burial of Lazarus? Okay. Now, again, we need to look at the pictures because I think it's just easier to understand pictures. Okay, a normal Jewish uh, wait, uh, burial, uh, Jesus, uh, get it right, um, Lazarus was buried in bandages. And in the Greek, they're called kairas. People say the Shroud of Turin isn't in the New Testament. Jolly well is. We just have to understand the Greek. So um, his face was covered in a napkin. It's called a sudarian. But his body was covered in bandages, and they're, covered, they're called kairas. So, so that's Lazarus. That's Lazarus. Sorry, okay. Lazarus in the grave. He was, he was, it took six hours, you know. It took six hours. Um, and by the way, when the two Marys came on the Sunday morning, they came with a great big pot of ointment and stuff, and they were going to do this for Jesus. They were going to cover him with bandages and all the ointment and the myrrh and the aloes and everything else. But he, they didn't have a chance because he had risen, risen from the dead, you see. Um, so Lazarus was, 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 he was uh, buried in grave windings 
or kairos around his body with this napkin or sudarin around his head. And that's basically what happened, and a normal one. We know that sudarin means a napkin because in the book of Acts, um, in Acts 18 actually, or Acts 19, sorry, uh, Paul actually gave uh, sudarians around to heal the sick. They're, it's called napkins or handkerchiefs, but the actual Greek is sudarian, you see? And so that's basically what happened. Now, the burial of Jesus was quite different. Shall we talk about the burial of Jesus now? That's very important. Because it's quite different. You see, with the burial of Jesus, um, they only had this short time. They had three, hour, three hours, six, three o'clock in the afternoon until six o'clock in the evening. That's when Passover started. And they had to get everything done and dusted by six o'clock in the evening. So what did they do? They got hold of um, Jesus was buried in these two different cloths. First of all, the Sidarian. The Shroud of Turin is in the Bible. I'm going to show you that. Um, he, uh, first of all, the Sindon or the Athonia. Now, uh, the Sindon is like a sail. Now, we know it's like a sail because in the book of Acts, um, uh, Peter had a vision and he saw all these animals coming down in a great... Uh, oh, sorry, I got this wrong, sorry. Start again. A Sindon, that's in, in the book of Mark. Let, let's go back to the book of Mark. I'm going through my slides too quickly, actually. The Sindon is described in the book of Mark in, Acts, in Mark 15, and it says, let me put my glasses on to read this, actually. And it says, he, Joseph of Arimathea, the wealthy guy who owned the garden tomb, he bought fine linen. The Greek word is Sindon. And they took him down and wrapped him in this linen. That's the Sindon, and they laid him in the tomb. All right? But also in Mark... It also used the word Sindon, also in Mark, in the chapter before. So let's see what it says. It says in, in Mark 14, it says, Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth, that's a Sindon, thrown around his naked body. So that was Mark. Mark had this huge piece of cloth around his body. And you remember the story, he, he left in, in Gethsemane, and he ran away naked. <laughs> but this piece of cloth wasn't just a little bit of bandage. This was a huge big piece of cloth to, to cover the whole of Mark. So it covered, the, you know, similar piece of cloth covered the whole of Jesus too. But also, uh, it's also called an athonia. And we know what an athonia is too. Because in Acts chapter 10, uh, if you remember Peter was sort of having a little bit of a sleep on the roof, <laughs> and uh, he saw all these animals coming down in a great sheet. The, the Greek word is athonia. So that's what this, this uh, shroud of Turin is, an athonia or a syndon. It's nothing like bandages. It's a great big piece of cloth, and that's exactly what it is. So there we are. So that's what they did with Jesus. And by the way, uh, the, the napkin that they put over his face, the, the um, sudarium, is still around. Uh, it's actually in Spain in a place called Oviedo. And uh, there's that picture of it. And it's got the same blood marks as on the Shroud of Turin. And it's very important, this Shroud. It's called the Sidarium of Oviedo. Because they know the history of this. And they know it came from at least 600. They know it, a guy called Philip came from Jerusalem. And he brought it there. Um, and it's got the same blood marks as on the Shroud of Turin. It's, got, it's been very carefully analysed by doc, uh, Dr. Alan Wanger, who's a emeritus professor and he says it comes from the same person well if it comes from the same person and this sudarium of Oviedo in Spain we know that it comes from before the, the, the seventh century well the, they got their dating wrong but we'll look at that later <laughs> wonderful <laughs> there we go all but right tell, tell us what, what what do you think is responsible for his own burial being different from that of Lazarus, because you said Lazarus had bandages all over. Yeah. And in this case... Well, so really, that's really good. See, it's really interesting. See, you know, a burial, um, in those days, they used to put people in like a, like a cave, and then they would come back after, after a while, and after all the, the, the flesh had decayed, and they put the bones in an ossuary. So you could have one cave or grave, and use it for lots of members of the family, and put all their bones in an ossuary. But what, what they did is they, they took for lots of members of the family and put all their bones in an ossuary. But what, what they did is they, they took at least six hours. It probably took a whole day. It took a lot of time. So with Lazarus, when he died, they took, you know, six, 12 hours and they wrapped him up in myrrh and aloes, all this ointment and all these bandages. And it took a long, long time. Mm. But because Jesus died at three o'clock in the afternoon and Passover started at six o'clock, they had to get everything done and dusted. And there wasn't time. That's why they used this special piece of this special, 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 unique, you know, this didn't happen normally. This is why they use this special uh, shroud of Turin. It's called an, a, a syndon or, or an athonia. People who study the shroud are called syndonologists because of that Greek word wow. syndon. Okay. okay, that's why. So, so what about the face cloth, though? 
Well, the face cloth, as I said, that, that's actually, the face cloth, the Sudarium, is in Oviedo in Spain. Um, and that's been extensively researched, and we know that Sindon, we know that uh, it, it was taken there by early Christians. It's locked in a, in a, in, in a wooden cabinet, and, it's, and in fact, the people of Oviedo say they don't know what all the fuss is about. They say, well, if we know the Sindon is, comes from the same person as the Shroud of Turin, the type of blood is type AB, all the blood markings are exactly the same, it was on the same face. So why do people think that the Shroud could possibly have been 1325 when we know that, that's, that this, this piece of cloth was on the same face? And we know, that, that we know the history of this piece of cloth, it definitely came to Spain in 1628. Wonderful. There we go. Now tell us, what research can you actually tell us you know, to prove that the Shroud is a first century cloth from Jerusalem? Well, thanks. That's a really, really good question. Well, we need to look at the pictures again. The historical authenticity of the Shroud of Turin, well, it definitely is authentic. Um, it's a piece of cloth, 14, 14 foot long, 3 foot wide, roughly. And it is, it's a man has been really severely crucified. Now, there's a, the world expert on ancient textiles. His, her name is, um, I have to put my glasses on, uh, Methchild Fleury Lemberg. And she works out of the famous museum of, uh, in uh, Switzerland's Abegg Foundation Textile Museum. And she is the world authority on ancient, ancient uh, textiles. And this is what she says. Uh, she says, uh, this is definitely a first century piece of cloth. It has dis uh, distinctive, exceptionally fine quality Z twist. It has a three over one herringbone pattern, a very distinctive joining seam. He says, she says, it's a very, very precious piece of ancient linen. And she says, actually, she's certain of this because it comes from, uh, she said it comes from a, a Greek or, sorry, a Syrian or an Egyptian loom. And what's more, what's more that this uh, material, identical material, probably woven on the same loom, is found in Masada. Have you been to Masada, Yemi? Yeah. Yeah. Well, up in Masada, they found identical cloth, probably woven, hand woven on the same loom. So she's absolutely convinced that this is a first century cloth. So there we have the world expert on ancient textiles says this is a first century cloth. Um, we'll move on a little bit to this picture. Now, here is a, what's called the Hungarian Prey Codex Manuscript. It's basically a parchment, and it's dated 1192. And basically, on the left there, you can see little poker holes. Well, there you, you can see those on the actual shroud. So we know that this... Whoever did the, whoever drew, it's not a photograph, they didn't have cameras. Whoever drew the Hungarian, it's a, it's a manuscript in, in Hungary, in 1192, actually did it direct from the Shroud of Turin. So there we are. Let's move on now. Now this, uh, this Dame Isabel Pixek, she's a Nobel Prize winner, by the way, and she's very, very highly acclaimed, and she's, very, she's a Nobel Prize winner. She, we're going to come to her again, because she's a physicist as well. But anyway, she says this is definitely not a painting. This is a, a most unusual thing, but there's no paint on it, and all sorts of technical things we haven't got time to go into. But, and what's more, there are coins over those eyes. Now, um, actually, you know, in our church, there's a lady there um, called Margaret. And she, when she started off nursing, when somebody died, they used to put little coins over the eyes to keep the eyelids shut. And they don't do it anymore, but that's what they did uh, when she started to train as a nurse, and that was not that long ago. Well, that's not what they did with Jesus. Well, those coins were minted by Pontius Pilate. They got coins dated AD 29 over the eyes, the eye sockets of the Shroud of Turin. Just look at those pictures there. Uh, over the eyes of those eye sockets, um, they were put over the eyes to keep the eyelids so eyelid uh, shut and this guy is an emeritus professor in California and he's done a lot of research I haven't got go time to go into it now but there are two separate coins both dated AD 29 by Pontius Pilate we all know who uh, Pontius Pilate is so the coins date the shroud for AD 29 I believe Jesus was crucified AD 33 some people think it was AD 30 but I think it was AD 33 but only anyway they put these little coins and they're two separate coins both minted AD 29 so there's one more and then uh, they found pollen on the shroud, Yemi. On the shroud, they found all this pollen, which comes from Jerusalem at the time of Passover. And not just a few pollen, lots and lots and lots of it. Uh, this is Dr. Max Fryer in the picture. Uh, he's a botanist and a Swiss criminologist. Uh, basically, he helped policemen to solve murder cases. Anyway, he did lots and lots of research when he was working for STIRP. That's the Shroud of Turin Research Project. And also, this is, this is the 
uh, Dr. Danin, who's a botany professor at Hebrew University, and Dr. Yuri Baruch, who's a pollen specialist at the Israel Antiquities Authorities. Then there's a German physics teacher called Oskar Schumann and Dr. Wanger again. And they've all done all this research, and I won't go through it because it's quite involved, but anyway, this is basically what Professor Danin, who's the current uh, botany professor says, this combination of flowers can be found in only one region of the world. The evidence clearly points to the floral grouping from the areas surrounding Jerusalem. So we know that the shroud was at one time in Jerusalem. And what else? It's not, it's not just that, there's a lot more. <laughs> there's sure. dirt on the shroud. You see, Jesus fell when he was carrying that heavy patibulum and he got some of the dirt off the road on his nose and on his left kneecap. And that dirt is special dirt because it's only found in Jerusalem, in ancient tombs. That's the only place on the planet they know where it is. And these guys, they researched it. I won't go through all their names because of time. Uh, by the way, there's a free DVD the viewers can get hold of uh, with all this stuff told in detail but much more slowly. Um, and they're saying that this shroud was definitely in Jerusalem and this particular dirt only comes from Jerusalem. So there we are. Um, one more thing is this, this shroud has been researched by so many people and uh, it's been particularly researched by Dr. Robert Bucklin, who's a forensic pathologist in Los Angeles. And by the way, he's a very senior forensic pathologist and he's done over 25,000 post-mortems. They call them autopsies, all right? And um, basically, I won't go through all the details, but I can tell you a little bit. He says there are puncture wounds in his wrists and his feet, puncture wound injuries to his head, multiple trauma, whip-like injuries all over his back, post-mortem puncture injury to the, to the right chest wall and then he goes on it says that the, there's only one person in the whole of history who fulfills this and that person is Jesus Christ this is a very very senior forensic pathologist wow 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 wow, <laughs> wow. this is serious yes and you said you've been actually interested in the shroud of Turin for the past 36 years yes but you know it took me it took me 32 years to work it out, how that shroud, how that image got there. We haven't got to that yet. <laughs> so, so what more can you tell us about this shroud and okay. what, what may be seen on it? Okay, well let's, uh, let's have a look now. Now we definitely need to look at the photographs now. Uh, first of all we can see the marks of the scourging. Now the, the, Jesus was actually, normally people were scourged 39 times, but actually poor, poor Jesus, he had 120 lashings and each of those lashings with the Roman, Roman flagrum had three of those uh, whips on it. And there are actually all these scourge marks from two separate soldiers all over his body. I don't know if you can see there on the right, all those scourge marks all over his back, all the way down his leg, all the way over his chest and the front of his legs. Uh, basically, it says in the book of Isaiah, it says that he was unrecognizable on the cross. Yeah. Just terrible. Then we can see the evidence of the crown of thorns on the face. Can you see that picture with the blood tracking down from the crown of thorns? Uh, from the lope bush, uh, very nasty spiky things and they were growing all over the uh, praetorium where Jesus was uh, bullied basically by the soldiers. Then you can make, make up the fractured nasal cartilages. You can see that his nose is actually bent. Um, then you can see the image of the nailing of the hands. Uh, now in all medieval pictures um, uh, basically you always see that the, that the nails go through the wrist, uh, through the palm of the hand, but in this case uh, it actually goes through the wrist and that's really important because I made, uh, Leonardo da Vinci or anybody else wouldn't have known that. It actually goes through the wrist. Um, and that actually is the position with Jesus on the cross. So he's not, he didn't die with his hands, with um, the back of his hands against the cross. No, he died with his, the palm of his hands against the cross as in that picture which was drawn by my daughter by the way. <laughs> with the thumbs pointing down. That's the actual position of the, the correct anatomical position of the crucifixion. And by the way, for viewers, if you'd like to feel in the back of your wrist, you can actually, you can have a try now. If you feel in the back of your wrist about here, you find a little, little, little hole. Yeah. Little hole there. That's called death dots point. Viewers, if you'd like to have a little feel here, in the back of your wrist here, you found a little hole. You know, there it is. You know, th those Romans, they, they had soldiers who did nothing else but crucify people, and they used to look for that hole and they used to put the nail right through there. And you can see that, go back to the pictures, you can actually see that, um, that is the correct place in the wrist. You see, if they put the nail through the palm of the hand, the weight of the body, Jesus weighed about 175 pounds, would have just ripped through the soft flesh of the hand. No, it had to go through the wrist. But of course, the medieval people didn't know that. 
Um, and, by, and by the way, on the shroud, I don't know if you can see that, but there's only, there's, you can't see the thumb. And that's because uh, I've, sh I've shown you the anatomical position of the, of, the, of the hand against the cross. When Jesus' body was, was, was weighing down on that one, uh, on that nail through his wrist, it, his hand became like a claw with, his, with, a, with a thumb pronated into the wrist. It just proves the authenticity of the, of the, of the shroud. And there's the nailing of the feet. Uh, and there's the blood coming from the nailing of the fleet feet. We know exactly where the nail went through the second and third metatarsal spaces. And you can also see on the shroud uh, where the lance was put through by the Roman soldier between the fifth and sixth right ribs. You can see the blood pooling on this picture here on the... Uh, if, you look at the if you look at the picture just for a second, uh, you can see the blood pooling on the, right, on the left hand side there where my pointer is, uh, as coming out of the, uh, the chest cavity. So there we are, authenticity wow. of the trial, it's absolutely authentic. Now we get to the really interesting stuff. Interesting, <laughs> wow. <laughs> you can see from the, from the information you're releasing there that he went through a lot of pain, serious pain. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah I've got a special presentation which is also free just on the crucifixion. And wow. it's just the most awful. Uh, you know we got this word excruciating. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, the word excruciating means the most terrible pain. And that's what poor Jesus had to go through. So you and I can go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. But then in 1976, yeah. NASA you know, carried, discovered uh, a three-dimensional uh, decoding. Uh, sorry, encoding. That's right. Can you tell yeah. us a bit about yeah, this? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, it's, now, this is really, really interesting. You see, uh, in 1976, we're talking about the, the moonshot, basically. Um, and, they, and they wanted to know what the back of the moon looks like. So what they did is they took lots and lots of photographs of the back of the moon. They sent a, a, an orbiting satellite around the back of the moon, took lots and lots of photographs, and they got all these photographs and fed them into a great big computer called a VPA image analyzing computer. And what this thing, there's it, there are these guys here. Uh, you can see the NASA picture up on the top left there and the Shroud of Turin top right, okay? Uh, and this guy, he's, a, he's a, uh, a really prominent physicist. There is actually the VPA Im image analyzing computer. And this, this guy is called Dr. John Jackson. He's a physics professor in the US Air Force Academy. And uh, so they knew what the back of the moon looked like, and they got a three-dimensional image of that. And somebody said, well, look, why don't you put the Shroud of Turin under this VPA image analyzing computer? Because the Shroud's always been controversial. So they said, okay, let's do it. So they did it, and what did they find? They found that the Shroud of Turin is unique, absolutely unique. It's three-dimensional. It's the only two-dimensional image on the planet it's dimensionally encoded. Can you see there the three-dimensional picture of the face of Jesus? Uh, the three-dimensional picture of the face of Jesus. There's a good one there. And it also applies to his whole body. So something happened at the resurrection which caused the whole, the whole of the Shroud of Turin to be dimensionally encoded in three dimensions. That's amazing. It's, it's dramatic, it's powerful, it's, there's no way Leonardo da Vinci or anybody else could do it. There's nobody, no way could anybody do it now. Nobody can do it. Nobody can do it. Uh, it's three-dimensionally encoded, it's absolutely fantastic. You mean, you mean it's technically impossible? <laughs> nobody, if you gave people uh, you, the entire US budget deficit, <laughs> they wouldn't be able to do it because nobody can do that. Nobody can. It, Give, get a, two, a bit of cloth and put three-dimensional encoding on it. Nobody can do it. We know how it's done, because we'll come to that, because Dr. August Assetta showed us how it's done. But nobody has ever been able to produce a Shroud of Turin. Do you know what? It would be easier for Leonardo da Vinci to design and launch the Hubble Space Telescope than to design the, the Shroud of Turin. Much easier. Wow Much easier, because technically that's been done. Nobody can do this now. So just put it in perspective. <laughs> uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, if you think he could have designed and launched a space telescope, well, that's one thing. He, may, he, he, may, he was a very clever guy. He, he could have done that. But nobody on planet Earth can do this. So no. Leonardo da Vinci couldn't, he couldn't, have done, he couldn't have done the Shroud of Turin. This is authentic, but it's a radioactive piece of cloth. And the question is, how did that radioactivity get there? That's the real thing. That's right. So, but the, you know, the thing is, thinking like a secular person or like a, like a skeptic, you know, could the could Shroud of Turin be, a, be you know, a fraud? Is it possible in any way 
because it's absolutely impossible. Just for a little bit of time, because everyone has been mesmerised by this rubbish. <laughs> that the shrouded Turin is 1325 approximately. It's got a lot of radioactivity, and the reason for that, we'll come to that. But we need to actually spend just a few minutes just showing that Leonardo da Vinci could not possibly have done it, nor can anybody else. Leonardo da Vinci couldn't have created a shroud of Turin. He was a very clever guy. By the way, that, uh, that was uh, Barry Schwartz, the official photographer, and he's public stated not once, but many, many times over the phone to me as well that the Shroud of Turin couldn't be created by the cleverest scientist in the world today. So it's not just me who says that, that's the official photographer of Stirp. However, as I've already said, there's the Hubble Space Telescope. He might have been able to do that, but he certainly couldn't do the Shroud. <laughs> so let's move on. So, um, nobody can create a fake Shroud of Turin in 2009. So here's my challenge to all the skeptics out there. If you want to create a, if you really, really believe that the Shroud of Turin was created by the Leonardo da Vinci or anybody else, let's just consider the, the, the challenges you've got. First of all, you've got to get a huge piece of first century cloth which will convince the leading world authority, that's Madame uh, Methiel Fleury of the, the Switzerland Textiles Museum, to say that this is a first century piece of cloth. Okay? Then you're going you to get on it uh, all these uh, pollen from Jerusalem and the calcium aragonite from Jerusalem. And then you've got to get uh, two separate coins. And by the way, these are virtually unobtainable. There are only five available on planet Earth. Wow. <laughs> but you've got to get two minted AD 29, all right? And get them uh, on the, you've got to get them on the, in the right place on the shroud. Uh, and then you've got to get your, um, you've got to get everything right. You've got to get scourging and the crown of thorns and the crucifixion nails and the Roman lance all in the right place. And then you've got to make sure that the blood is type AB and exactly matches exactly matches the Shroud of Oviedo, which is a lockbox guarded in Oviedo in Spain. All right. Um, and then, um, and that's all pretty simple stuff, by the way. Uh, you've then got to do something else. Uh, you've now got to do something which nobody can do today. You've got to scorch an image of a crucified man onto this linen which you've discovered and done everything else to it using uh, an unknown laser radiation technique which nobody has today. In 2010, nobody has this. And uh, it, this it must include distance imaging properties, which will convince the uh, NASA that this is the genuine article. All right, and they, nobody can do that today. Um, then what else have you got to do? You've got to backdate your carbon dating to 1325. You've got to be able to take it back to the British Museum and say, here's another one, date this, and it'll be 1325. Nobody knows how to do that either. <laughs> um, and then you've got, to, uh, you've got to get those poker burn holes in it. That's another problem. But then you've got a really difficult problem because you've got uh, photographic experts, nuclear physicists, botanists, archaeologists, historians, forensic pathologists, uh, radiologists, carbon dating experts, textile experts, and experts in ancient antiquities, all of which have studied this thing and say it's genuine. There are some of their names, not all of them, just some of them, and you've got to convince them, and there's about 20 there, but there are literally thousands of them, um, and then you've got to do something else, <laughs> all right? Because you have got to come up with some technology. If you think that Leonardo da Vinci created this thing, you have got to tell me how he did it. Because if I told you, let me look at the viewer now, let me look at the viewer. I say to you, look, I want you to create something using time technology. Time technology will be available in 600 years' time, and I want you to create a, a, an image using time technology. We don't know what it is because it isn't available right now, but I want you to use it. Now, Leonardo da Vinci lived about 600 years ago, and he's used some technology which wasn't available until 1976. So, to take the analogy forward, if you really think you are about to go and create something, all I want to do is create something using technology that will be available and proven in 600 years' time and create this thing using technology which will be available in 600 years' time and people say, oh yes, that's great. Do you see the problem? I don't think people really do see the problem, but it's a very real problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now so tell us about the eight, uh, 1325 AD carbon dating in 1988, yeah. well, this how, and how you know it could be possible for three separate separate laboratories in London, Switzerland, and USA to get to, to get it wrong. How can they get it wrong? Well, you know they didn't get it wrong. In a way, they didn't get it wrong. So we just need a little bit about carbon dating. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on carbon dating. It's all on my free DVD. But 
Carbon is, uh, there are 111 elements, okay, and the C C12 is the well-known carbon, carbon. It actually comes in the normal form, which is C12, but it also has isotopes, uh, C13 and C14, which are radioactive. I'm not going to go, because of time, how it becomes radioactive. It all happens up high in the clouds, seven miles up in the air, and you get a little bit of C13 and a little bit of C14, which comes floating down in the carbon dioxide, goes into the plants, and then you and I, Yemi, we eat the plants, and then we become a little bit radioactive. Everything is slightly radioactive. All right? So all the plants become a little bit radioactive, but this radioactive active, uh, isotopes of C14, it decays over 5,730 years to half of it. So, if you've got um, a little bit of uh, radioactive C14 and you come back 5,730 years later, there's only half of it left, and that's the whole basis of carbon dating. Uh, I won't go into it now, but it's actually fraudulent. That's in another thing on creation, which we'll be talking about next time, Jimmy. <laughs> but anyway, the original uh, uh, the linen of the shroud was made from flax, and it was slightly radioactive because it incorporated carbon dioxide, uh, which incor incorporated a little bit of radioactive carbon, carbon dioxide. All right? But that was a first century shroud, and a lot of it would decay by now. Um, what actually happened is, here's an important thing, just look at the picture, there is a carbon dating machine, it's as big as a house. <laughs> they're enormous, these things. And all they tell you is how much, there are the three cynics up there, they're saying dated 1260 to 1390. They've done their radioactive carbon dating, they say, this shroud is very radioactive. It it's therefore must be a 1325 shroud, because if it was a first century shroud, it wouldn't be radioactive. Do you see what they're saying, Yang? They're saying it's a very radioactive shroud. So I want you to feel just to look at their pictures for a second because this is the whole crux. This is my theory. Um, I have to say, it, I haven't got much that's original of my own work, but this actually is original. And by the way, my work is, shroud, is on shroud.com, which is the shroud website. Now, if it was a first century shroud from the time of Christ, according to the... Uh, the carbon dating guys, the experts, they call themselves, they say if it was a first century shroud, there should be very little radioactive. That's why I've made that shroud look pale. And the glass is empty. A very, there's no radioactivity. It's a first century shroud, so most of the radioactivity is what they call decayed. It's an old shroud. But they came along and they said, our Geiger counter machine, our, radio, our carbon dating machine, actually it says it's a very, very radioactive machine. Therefore, according to our... Th our uh, understanding this must be dated 1325 approximately because it's very radioactive but of course they completely discounted the resurrection and that's why it's radioactive it isn't that it's 1325 it's definitely a first century shroud because i told you nobody can cre can create that image uh, Leonardo da Vinci nobody else can create it it was created by Jesus at the time of the resurrection the question is how did that image how did that shroud get radioactive well it happened at the resurrection it, uh, the Shroud of Turin, if there hadn't been a resurrection, would, would look like that, very pale, but actually it looks like that, very, very radioactive. And the next question is, well, how did it get so radioactive? Which brings us to the next question. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If you're struggling with the technical jargon, <laughs> because the Dr. Kent is a very, very intelligent man, so if you're hearing so many things that are too heavy, you know, what I like encourage you to do is to go onto his website and you can actually order the DVD or CDs or anything you want free of charge. They send them to you so you can actually sit back and go through them methodically because he's <laughs> releasing so much information. It's unbelievable. But you know what? Get on the website and the details of the website are on the screen for you to write down and go actually get your own copy. God bless you. <laughs> now tell me, Doctor, yes. are there any other examples from the Bible of, you know, radiation? You know, like well, there are, there are. I need to apologize to the viewers. I'm really sorry. Uh, I've, I've been talking at, uh, like a machine gun. There, <laughs> uh, there is an awful lot of information here, and I'm trying to sort of give you a real feel for the shroud. And, but what Yemi says is absolutely right. We do have a website, it's our church website, actually, uh, and we do send free DVDs all over the world. And you are very welcome. We really want you to have this. So just get onto the website, and you can just click on there, and you can get a free DVD. That's great. That's what we, what we want you to have. Uh, I want to answer your question, but I want to come first back to this Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist called, uh, if you look at the picture, Dame Isabel Pixek, who's a particle physicist, and she explains how that image got on the shroud. 
and she, remember, is a Nobel Prize winning physicist, so I think we ought to listen to what she says, don't you, Yemi? Mm. She says there was what's called an event horizon. She says that when this image was formed, there was no gravity, no entropy, no gravitational collapse, no time, no space. Now, it's, I'm not going to go in detail about event horizons, but there's only one other event horizon in the whole of the history of this planet, and that was creation. So basically, all the normal laws of physics were suspended when the, uh, the shroud was created. That's what this Nobel Prize winning physicist has to say. All right, so I think we should let, remember that, that the creation of the shroud is quite different from anything in our experience. So now let's think about, oh, by the way, before we get to exactly how the shroud, I'm going to have to move on quickly, how did the shroud get there? Well, Dr. Augustus Setter is a very brave man. He, he's a radiologist. He looked at those shrouds and he said, that looks like an X-ray to me. So what do you know what he did? He, radi he injected himself with radioactive material and stood in front of the VPA image analyzing computer and got a sort of radioactive image. There it is on the right. Um, it's all explained in detail on our free DVD. But anyway, you can see that picture on the right. And it says, and he says there's no question that the image on the shroud got there not by paint, but by radiation. And that's how it got there. Right, so the image was caused by radiation. On the left there, uh, we have the image that uh, Dr. Asetta created of himself. And on the right, the much better image of the shrouded Chirin. And he also noted the X-ray appearances because light was released, it's full of gamma rays and x-rays and the visuals, visible spectrum. But now we're going to come on to the, um, the question you asked about Jesus. You see, uh, God is actually light, and in him is no darkness at all. So it's all about light. So we need to study what the Bible says about light. Now, there are two occasions, to answer your question, where Jesus... Uh, well, there's one occasion where Jesus was covered in light and another occasion where somebody else was covered in light and they both were radioactive phenomenon. And let's look at them both now. The first one was the transfiguration. That's in Matthew 17. Uh, most of the viewers will be familiar with this. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John and his brother, led them up a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking to him. Wow! So Jesus was actually in his, resurre in his resurrection eternal body, and he was in eternity because there was Moses and Elijah. Now, in physics, um, we, we understand time. We don't really understand time. It's the fourth dimension. But we say, if you were able to move beyond the speed of the light, you would be in eternity. Right? That's basically the definition of eternity. It's moving beyond the speed of light. Wow. So at this point, Jesus was actually moving beyond... Here, the molecules and the atoms of his body were moving beyond the speed of light. And that's why the light shone through his clothes. And that's why his face shone like the sun. It was, it was radiating light. And light is a, a radiation. It's X-rays and gamma rays and infrared and the visible spectrum and lots more beside and photons and neutrons and protons and everything. Wow. And, and quarks and everything, you know. So there's a real radiation phenomenon. But um, the, other, the other example is, uh, is... Let me move on quickly. Is where... I haven't really got time to go into all this, uh, but I'm going to talk about Moses. Here we go. Moses went up the mountain to talk to God and receive the Ten Commandments. And he was in contact with God. We don't know how long he was in contact with, but when he came down, his face was radiating with light. And that was a radioactive phenomenon. So Moses was in contact with God, and when he came down and received those Ten Commandments, there's, there is Moses receiving his Ten Commandments, when he came down, his face was radiating with light. Now let's move back to the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin covered Jesus' body. And when, that, when the Holy Spirit came into Jesus' body, he, he, this was this, the, the dead body of Jesus, which had been in that tomb for three days and three nights, suddenly came to life again with a blast of radiation. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit came and he may well have appeared like he appeared at the Transfiguration. But I tell you what, there's a lot of light there because God is light. And all that light came through and it scorched the upper fibrils of this Shroud of Turin. It was a very, very radioactive process. But like everything else with God, it's not gentle. It didn't cause the whole Shroud to completely deteriorate and burn up. No, it left a scorch mark of the resurrection. 
So there we have it. Wonderful. It proves the resurrection. I'm absolutely convinced of it. <laughs> I really thank God for your life because, you know, I, I like listening to scientists like yourself because my mentor went to Imperial College. Oh, right. Where he teaches, he teaches along the line, the, the same way you present things. And he spoke once and he said, listen, he said, the first thing that God spoke into existence was light. Yes. I said, the fastest moving object on earth is light. Yes. And he said, if you have a fan and you can boost the power in that fan to make it travel at the speed of light, it will simply disappear. Yeah. It's another speed of the spirit realm. Yeah, yeah. eternity. And yeah. it's in line with what you're saying. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Now, so how do you believe that the image got onto the cloth in a photo negative? Ah, well, we don't really know. Um, the answer is, I can't answer that question because I wasn't there. I don't understand it. All I know is there was a radiation phenomenon. Um, I'll tell you what, um, if you can imagine, I'll, I'll do a sideways thing for the, for the camera. If that is Shara Turin over my face, all right, yes. you can imagine the point of my nose is nearer the shroud than the orbits deeply yep. recessed. So if there was an amount of radiation coming from my face, then there's more radiation on the part of the cloth that's right close to my yeah. nose than from deep in the orbits. So can you imagine radiation coming from my body? I'm not trying to be blasphemous here, but just trying to explain a position. Uh, if there's a lot of radiation coming from my body, then the, the material that's close to my nose will get more radiation than the orbits. Um, and similar with the rest of my body, you see. So maybe, but I mean, this is speculation because I wasn't there, but we have to, you know, we have to read between the lines. But maybe that's how a photonegative image got there. But it jolly well got there. And it, there's no way, there's absolutely no way that, that that can be a fraud because they couldn't do it. Nobody can do it now. It got there because of the resurrection. It proves the resurrection. In fact, you know, the Shroud of Turin is basically a parable. Jesus said about parables, he said, people will look and they won't see. That's what they're doing. They look and they don't see. The only people who understand that Shroud of Turin are born again Christians. And I hope the viewers out there are beginning to understand this now because this is the most exciting thing. You don't need the Shroud of Turin. I believe the, the resurrection because the Bible says so. That's but right. Why, jolly, this, this jolly well helps, doesn't it? Amen. <laughs> it does. It surely does. Yeah. Praise God. Mm. Now tell me, in your opinion, does the Shroud prove the resurrection of Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question of a doubt. I don't need um, the, 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 the Shroud of Turin to prove the resurrection to me because I believe the Bible, that's another study we're going to do, the supernatural authority of the Bible. I'm going to prove to the viewers without a question of a doubt that this Bible, here's a Bible, is the only supernatural book on the planet. I'm going to prove that. Absolutely. You're booked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. We're going to prove that. But I believe it, the resurrection because the Bible says so. And because Jesus said he did, and because he was seen by 500 uh, disciples, and then he went to heaven, and the reason you and I are sitting here is because we both believe it, all right? Amen. But the thing is that the, the, we have a first century piece of cloth which is very radioactive, and the fact that it's radioactive means that something happened to it. And the only thing that I know of that could possibly have happened that caused that, radio, uh, radio, that, that, that burn mark, it's a burn mark or a scorch mark, is the resurrection. As far as I'm convinced, I'm absolutely personally convinced it caused that the Shroud of Turin scientifically proves the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know what? I want to encourage you because unfortunately the time we have is so limited. So as a result, we're not able to read out your emails today because he had to pack as many information as possible into this program. I want to encourage you to go onto the website of the ministry and order the free DVDs. There are free DVDs, the three books, and so many other materials that will bless you. And I'm sure a lot of you have friends across the whole world that you want to send things to. Please go on that website. And, and I thank God for the life of the man of God because they are prepared to send materials anywhere you want in any part of the world, be it Timbuktu or Papua New Guinea or anywhere. <laughs> They'll make sure they look after your person there. Now tell me, Doc, this program, I thank God for your life. It's, 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 a, it's a very powerful program. Tell us, what kind of subjects should we ex expect in the future? Exciting subjects. Well, let me tell you, in two weeks' time, we've got creation and evolution. We're not, we haven't decided yet. Yeah, maybe we're going to do creation one day and then evolution the next day <laughs> or whatever. But we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about near-death experiences because, you know, I've written books and movies, for movies which are free on the website too, about uh, life after death and people who've died and come back to life again. And we're going to talk about biblical archaeology, Noah's Ark and Sodom and Gomorrah and crossing the Red Sea and Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about evangelism and uh, we're going to talk about money. 
that's a big problem for people. And by the way, viewers, <laughs> uh, God doesn't want to have money problems. Now, wow. Jesus didn't have any money problems. That's right. And we're going to talk about money. Wow. And we're going to talk about, um, well, we're going to have to get this right, but we need to talk about life in the womb. But that's a sensitive subject, so we need to talk about that sensitively. Life on the womb. Life in the womb. Oh, in the womb, sorry. Life okay. in the womb. Life in the womb. Yeah, Wonderful. we need to talk about life in the womb and how precious life in the womb is. But that's a sensitive subject. Wonderful. What about Noah's Ark? Yeah, we, we've got lots of pictures of Noah's Ark to show you. Not, to, not now, another time, but okay. we're going to show you. But it's in eastern Turkey, you know. Okay. And, uh, you know, the Turkish authorities, they built a visitor center there for Noah's Ark. Wow. And it's 515 foot long. 515 wow. foot long, which is 300 Egyptian cubits, which proves it's Noah's Ark. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> then also, we're going to talk about the uh, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Because some people say it's in Egypt, some say it's in Saudi Arabia. And, uh, well, let me tell you, Galatians 4.25 says it's in Saudi Arabia. Wow. Galatians so 4.25 says... I know when we get together, you'll be able <laughs> to give us facts and figures to, yeah. to prove to us exactly where it is. Well, there are, I can show you um, guys... Who, uh, talking about Mount Sinai now, it's got um, what are called a petroglyphs drawings actually on, you remember Aaron built a golden calf? Well, on the, on the side of the golden calf, it's got petroglyphs of the Greek gods, uh, sorry, the uh, Egyptian gods, Hathor and Apis. And they've got guys from Cairo, Egypt, and also um, Muslim people who say, well, this is definitely uh, authentic. Wonderful. Yeah. And then also, you, uh, you know, we, we showed some material on our, t on our channel recently, the Lazarus phenomenon. Yes. And that, comes, that came from you, did it? Or? Well, it came from, uh, that was made by a Hollywood film director, because I can't make films. <laughs> I'm an amateur, you know. But I read a couple of books, which are free on the website. Um, but he got hold of these books. He says, wow, this is great. So basically, he, he actually made two films, The Lazarus Phenomenon and The Final Frontier, which you can watch on the website. And by the way, they're both shown the other book, the other film as well, is also shown on Revelation TV quite regularly now, I think. And uh, they're great, aren't they? Now tell me, how, how important is it for Christians to use a lot of materials like that for evangelism, to reach out to friends who are not Christians? Well, I think that, I, that's, what we, that's, what we, that's the whole point of our ministry. We, um, I've actually traveled to 27 countries now. Um, but actually what people really need, they don't need me, what they need is material they can use hand out to their friends. We've got a, a movie called, When You Die, Would You Like to Go to Heaven? Wow, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and people get hold of this, and it's a movie of people who actually died, who actually died. There's one guy, you know, who died for three days and three nights. <laughs> and he came back to life during a Reinhard Bonnke uh, um, yeah. revival thing. Yes. And he told everyone what heaven and hell was like. And of course, wow. Ian McCormack is a personal friend of mine. That's He's right. on the movie. They went back to the to Nigeria to, to film it, and they went to, uh, oh, there we go, oh, time's gone. But <laughs> life is exciting. <laughs> That's right. Well, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming over, yeah. and God bless you. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes. Well, on that note, we want to thank you so much for being with us, and um, we'll be back your way same time next week. But please, don't touch that two weeks, dial. Two weeks, two weeks. In two weeks' time, sorry. And there's a lot more to come your way. God bless you.